Hi everybody! So today, it's time for some digital painting. I'm going to show you how to do pretty much what I did here with this sphere. It's actually relatively simple. Uh, I'll show you some little tricks to do something like this. Uh, of course, digital painting is very similar to traditional painting in just about every way, but having the tools that we have here, there's certain shortcuts we can take to do simple things like this. Learning the shortcuts is just one step towards mastery, but something like this um, is very basic. It's like the basics of drawing one, learning how to create tone and make something look three-dimensional, how to indicate a light source and show cast shadow and form shadow. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a new file, custom shape. I'm just making it a square, 12 inches by 12 inches, 300 pixels per inch, RGB color, white background, go ahead and create it. Now the first thing I'm going to do is make my background layer unlocked, and that way I can edit it. I'm also going to create another layer, this will be my transparent empty background layer, and then this layer I'm actually going to edit, fill, 50% gray. I'm going to make another layer on top. I've got a transparent layer, I've got a 50% gray fill layer, and then I've got another transparent layer on top of that. And what I'm going to do in this transparent layer is select the gradient tool. And I'm selecting foreground to background, and in this case white to black. And see what I did there? I dragged from the upper right corner to the lower left. This is kind of standard fare when it comes to adding a light source. It's always coming from a three-quarter view angle, usually above, indicating something like sunlight or a lamp light. So you can see that's on top of my gray fill layer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over and I'm actually going to drop the opacity just a little bit. Uh, not too far. You still want that indication of the gradient. I just don't want it to be as strong as what I had initially. Then I'm going to make another layer. Come up to my rectangular marquee tool and I'm just going to cordon off the bottom section and I'm going to fill that. I'm going to do it the same way I did the full square. And then again I'm going to drop the opacity some. Okay, and then you can command D to deselect that. So now it looks like I've got a wall and then maybe some type of a surface here. Um, so next step, create another layer. And this time I'm going to get my elliptical marquee tool. And remember, if you hold in shift while you're dragging this, it should remain a perfect circle, which is what you want. Make it pretty big. And you can add in the space bar there to move it um, mid-transform. I'm just going to kind of place it here, maybe stretch it a little bit further, and then let go. So I've got my ants marching. And this is in its own layer. I'm going to edit, fill. 50% gray, once again. There's different ways to go about painting, and since what we're doing right here is like a grayscale image, what we're focused on is value as opposed to hue. So since we're focused on value, of course we could always paint things in with a paintbrush, uh, brush being right here, we could change the size, we would probably want to work if we're trying to make this look realistic, trying to make it look like it has a gradient to it, you want to choose a soft round brush. Those would be in the general brushes. This is a soft round, Maybe that's a hard round. So you get that soft fuzzy edge. Or you could use some tools that we have since uh, not really worked with. It's been, it's been quite a while actually since we brought these up. This was one of the first maybe three exercises. The burn and dodge tools. Remember what those do. Burning is essentially shading or adding black. Dodging is adding adding white, so you're tinting. Um, so that's what we want to do here is we want to pick the burn tool. I like to go with uh, my darks first. I'm going to make my burn tool brush size really big. Let's go with 600. I got my softness all the way down. That's about the right size for what I'm doing. 
and I'm actually going to duplicate this layer before I do this. Command J. That way I'm not destructively editing yet. I'm just doing this as a little test. I'm going to hold in the command key and click on my layer icon so that my ants are marching again. And the purpose of that is as long as I have this selection to paint inside, I can go all the way to the edge and it won't matter. It's not going to go over that line, that selection that I've created, which is pretty nice. I'm going to change my exposure a little bit. I'm bringing it up. I had it in like at the 30 range. I'm bringing it up to the 50 range for this. And I'm just following the curvature of the sphere, blocking in the area that I assume will be light. And since the exposure is down, I can go over the same area multiple times and it will gradually build up into this form shadow I'm creating. You see I'm leaving some on this side. That's called bounce light. It's reflective light. It's what gives something a three-dimensional quality. In order to be 3D, it has to have three phases, a highlight region, a shadow region, and then usually some kind of ambient or bounce light that's reflected off of a wall or surface. Um, so having that in there is what's going to make it appear 3D. So I've filled up that shadow pretty nicely. I'm going to come over and change to my dodge tool. I have my dodge tool set a little bit smaller. Uh, that's alright, I can kind of work in a focused region. The area that's right where the light source is, so now i kind of built that up on purpose. It's a hot spot. It's the reflective light itself, whatever the shape of the light is. Uh, and then from there it will gradually fade into the shadow section. Now, it's a little choppy. I could spend some time changing my exposure and going back over areas a little bit at a time if I you know, wanted to be real picky about it. And it's fun, you know, it's like painting. The act of painting is fun. But maybe you're just trying to get something to look a certain way real quick. Well, that's a good time to jump to one of your filters. In particular, under blur, a good old Gaussian blur. See what that did? It kind of softened everything out and uh, you can stretch that a little bit if you want to. Take it to there. And then if I want to, I can edit it even further. It'll still be working in the same layer. Or I can create another layer and keep going on top of what's already there. Just trying to make it look like a smoother transition. I'm actually going to ditch that layer. And what I'm going to do here, this is kind of interesting. So. This was my burn and dodge layer. I'm going to duplicate it. And then I'm going to change the blending mode on the duplicate to overlay. Look what it did there. It really blasted the, uh, the contrast. So now I can bring my opacity down and just see if I like, like it boosted a little bit. It makes it look even more 3D. It popped even a little bit more. Okay, one more layer. This time I'm going back to my paintbrush, switching to the black and my opacity, I'm taking it almost all the way up into the 80s. I'm just gonna like do this, make like a little circle. And I'm going to Gaussian blur that. And then I'm gonna transform it, I'll stretch it out. Bring it down here somewhere and put it behind those two circle layers. Which I could actually, if I wanted to, uh, merge those now. If you're happy with the, the higher contrast version of it, you could just merge that down. Uh, but yeah, I just put in like a little cast shadow. Uh, it's in this layer. I can move that around. See how I made that? All I did was create a big splotch, a dot, and then stretched it out, changed the opacity a little bit. Um, Stretch it even further. The area of the shadow that will be the darkest is what's called the blocking shadow. It's right here next to the actual object where the object's in contact with the surface. From there, the further out it gets, the more faded it will become because more of the light sources, uh, ambient light, will bounce around and interact with that shadow. You know, it looks a little bit different than the other one. Yeah, I made the shadow real dark on that one. Uh, but you get the idea. Uh, so knowing those conventions, knowing that 
you know, there's always a core shadow, there's always some type of bounce light, there's always highlight, maybe a hot spot in there, uh, and that the cast shadow is darkest near the object. Knowing those things enables you to realistically render light. That was the first part of what I wanted to show you today. Not too bad, went pretty quick. So I'm pretty happy with how that turned out. I'm actually gonna duplicate it and just check out some of our more artistic filters. Let's go to the filter gallery. Give it a second to load up. And I'm actually gonna shrink it down so I can see it a little bit better. Now it's already got one of the filters on there, the cutout filter, that's what it looks like. Uh, but you can go through some of these and see what they do. Each one's going to be a little bit different. Sometimes it'll impart texture, sometimes it'll stylize it really heavily. Uh, but it's worth it to check them out, because you might find one that you really enjoy. That one's pretty cool. I like the lines in the background on that. That's the fresco one. Uh, let's try plastic wrap. It's like wrapping everything in plastic. It's kind of weird about poster edges. This one I use a lot because actually it gives me a nice hard edge around everything and then I can um, go over here and change my blending mode, maybe to multiply and then change the opacity again. This makes it look a little bit sharper, more high contrast once again. And you can do as many of these as you want just to test out all those different filters and what they do. Okay. Here's one other thing, I'll just merge this down. Uh, I'm gonna put in a fill layer and put in any color that I want. Let's do this, feeling green today. The sun's shining, I feel like getting outside here in a little bit. So I'm gonna go with green and I'm doing it multiply. So there I've got like this green color to work with. And now what I could do is make another layer, make it an overlay layer. And I'm still working in black and white here. I'm going to jump to my white, jump to my brush, um, make my brush maybe a little bit smaller, maybe drop the opacity a little bit, and you just got to experiment with these things. Come in here, and maybe I can paint some areas and make it have even a higher contrast than it already did. Now, yeah, I need a softer brush, probably at a lower opacity to get this. not be so stark but I'm also going to use that Gaussian blur again it really does some of the extra work for me just don't want to overuse things like that you want to be able to do the stuff on your own but it's not bad to have a couple things you fall back on and that you repeat see what that did it just kind of punched up the value a little bit let's see what it looks like taking it away putting it back in add a little bit of visual sizzle to whatever it is that you're doing. That's the first part of this that I wanted to show you. You can flatten that or you can save it as a Photoshop document so you can come back to it at another time. So we finished up with the sphere. Now what I'd like you to do is go into Google and search for a picture of some type of fruit. How about, um, let's go with an apple. Remember when we're using images, if we want to be ethical about it, we always click on Tools, Usage Rights, Labeled for Reuse with Modification, and then we can select what we'd like to use from there. Let's try this one. I'm just going to grab it and drop it into Photoshop. There, we can see it pretty good. I am actually going to crop the image a little bit. Crop it to there. Okay, so that's currently my background. I'm going to make my background. I'm going to unlock it. I'm going to make a new layer underneath it. And then I'm going to go under Image, Canvas Size. Right now it is about two and a half wide, so I'm going to double that up. Five, and I'm going to anchor it. What I did there. I'm going to anchor it to the left. Change the width to five. So the apple stays to the left, and it gave me a little more canvas area over here. Make a new layer on top up here. 
you could do this a couple different ways. You could sketch this, which you would want to do with a paintbrush. You want to make the size very small, maybe like a three or a five. Put your hardness all the way up, opacity all the way up, and then pick a colors that are going to be very visible for this part. And just make your way around the outside. I mean, that would be one way to do it. An easier way to do what we're about to do here would be, remember we can use the rectangular marquee tool to select just that section. We'll make sure we're in the right layer here. And grabbing my magic wand tool, making sure that the third one over, the subtract from selection, is what's depressed, what's pressed in. And then just click around the little magic wand that has the minus sign in front of it and it will select the shape of the apple. And I can jump up to that empty layer and do edit, fill, and I want to pick a color like a relative mid-tone or like a slightly darker mid-tone. That looks good. Hit OK. And I can jump to my move tool and I can just move that guy right over. So now I have a, a mid-tone to work from. And from here, this is where the actual painting starts. See, if I make that invisible, I can see that it's still a selection. And that's what I want. Just like with the sphere, you want to stay inside the line. So it's nice to have that area selected, ready to go. I'm going to pick my brush tool. I'm going to make it larger. Make sure that I'm using a soft round brush. My opacity, I'm going to drop just a little bit. Let's drop it down to like 70. Brush is way too big. Size that. You know, the bracket keys above and to the left of the return key will enable you to change the size of your brush. It's the same thing as going up here and using the scale, of course. Um, so I'm going to come over here with the option key and pick some of this lighter red, paint some of that on top over here, which I think that's that's way too too dense, too saturated, I'm bringing my opacity down even further. There we go. Now that enables me to build it up. So every time I pick up the, the stylus and then put it back down, it gets a little bit brighter. over, have the color for the highlighted region, and then we can make my brush smaller. Get that super concentrated right there. Okay, so now that I've painted in sort of a map for some of the values, what I think I'm going to do with those is I'm going to blur them and see how it looks and use Gaussian Blur. have the softest indication of a path for where I'm taking all of this. Then I'll come back to my brush tool, make it a little bit smaller, and start sampling colors again. I'm going to sample the color of the stem. jump in here and I'm going to get some of this lighter area that's indicating the top part of the apple where there's an indentation. And back to some of these same colors I've already used and just come back on there a little bit at a time. Pull a little darker areas. Let's do that blur again. Now at this point, maybe you want to mess around with the smudge tool or something like that. Just manipulate some of the, some of the 
colors that way. That would be fun. Definitely create some texture that way. Because this apple does have these sort of striations and I should open up that highlight. And bring down my stem. There's some high contrast going on there that I'm gonna need to address with some other colors. And now we're just you know, building into this a little bit of a time. See why I like the smudge tool, it gives me a little bit more of a sense that I'm actually painting this, even if I am swapping colors and tracing the outline, I'm still doing something that makes it, uh, makes it a little imperfect. See how painting these in is helping to make it feel more round as well. So maybe now I could you know, blur that just a little bit, just a little bit. So now I can come back on top of it again. This time I'm going to make my brush very small. And then I'm going to pick some of these little areas like this and the areas of the dots. You can actually create like a texture brush for this. Eventually I'm going to show you guys how to do custom brushes. Today is not that day. I'm going to pick more of this lighter color, put a few more of these up here. So I'm going to jump back to my brush, get some of that in there. Smudge tool again, making it real tiny this time. I got the yellow, I didn't get some of that green at the bottom. Maybe I need to grab a little bit of that green with the brush and the eyedropper tool. Like it looks green. But it's, it's the simultaneous contrast of it being right next to the red. It's actually not green at all. Um, so now that I've got that, I'm actually going to merge that down on top of what I've already got, make another layer on top, and this time I'm going to do an overlay layer. And I'm going to paint with black and white in overlay. At a lower opacity, just to come in and figure out some more of these values. I need my brush to be larger. And it needs to be softer as well. So you'll have to experiment with this kind of stuff. Just keep jumping back and forth, seeing what you like. that that I just added there. It's actually going to be blurred quite a bit because it's very it's very heavy. It's good. I'm going to come back to the top of this and jump to white. I'll do this and get another layer. Still doing overlay. I'm going to separate my black and white overlay layers here so that I have a little more control over them. Brush smaller. And I'm actually going to drop the opacity even further. And yeah, this takes a little bit of time. Just like 
real honest to goodness painting does. Even though I've got something that I'm copying, even though I'm sampling colors directly from it in order to create this, it's still going to take some time. The condensation that's on the top of it. I haven't tried to do any of that yet. I've gotten a lot of these striations, a lot of little dots that I can get if I were to come in here and really scrutinize all these little things. Like I could sit here and do this all day long. But there are other things I should probably do. I'm going to blur that just a little bit. That's too much. Make sure that I still have some texture in there. But you can see how this is building up a little bit at a time. And then I could come in and really start scrutinizing. So you see how this is working. I'm getting it a little bit at a time. But it's going to take some time to build up get all this area, get all these areas that are, you know, very dark. And if I want to check it at any point, the nice thing is I can just move it over on top. Change the opacity and just look at where some of my values need to be mapped out better. And just pop it back over here and keep it out. But yeah, if you zoom out, you can see it's starting to look something like it. I've obviously developed this area the best. We use the most smudging so it's the most you know, inconsistent. This area needs a lot of work because it's still very you know, misty and looks very computer generated. Uh, but that's the idea is to create these textural stripes and striations and dots and things like that to make it look more like an actual object and less like a computer painted object. Try picking out a type of fruit by looking for a picture on your own and create something like this. I'll just show you real quick here something else. Um, I'm going to go in here and see what kind of brushes I have. There's all kinds of like texture brushes. If I were to change the spacing on this, see I clicked on this folder icons if I can pick a new brush. It's huge right now. Obviously I don't want it to be that big. Bring it way down. There we go. And then I can come back in here and I can pick a younger color. Something like that. And that would be a way that I could come in and create some texture on top of this. Get more of these little dots. There's a lot of options with the brush tool, a lot to explore there, and we'll do more next time. Um, but for today, what I would recommend you do is work yourself through the sphere exercise, then find a picture of a piece of fruit online and attempt to do what I do here. If you recall, I brought it in, I used the that subtractive method where we use the rectangular marquee tool with the magic wand, remove the background, make it a selection, created a new layer, and then just filled that layer with a relative midtone. And ever since, I've kept that same selection and just made new layers and painted on top and added filters and blending modes and just worked towards replicating something. Um, and I'm using the brush tool often, using the option key to switch to the eyedropper and just sample colors as I go. And that's how I'm going to get things to look kind of like they do. Okay, so that was a step-by-step -step way of using Photoshop to create or at least start doing some digital painting. Um, hey, it's not my best work, but I thought it was a good first draft to just kind of show you what you can do. So if I were doing this, I probably would have just you know sketched it freehand, painted it whatever, uh, added some values, maybe even started off black and white and done some kind of a, a gradient map on top of it. That's something we haven't done yet and we will do is uh, use gradient map on top of the black and white image. We'll do that maybe next time, okay? So try this. Try the sphere first and then try picking a fruit offline and just painting it in the same method, giving yourself a, a larger canvas to work from so you can work side by side. Uh, it's fun. It's a fun thing to do. So give it a shot. And uh, until next time, guys, enjoy yourselves. And if you have any questions, you can always email me. All right, thanks a lot.